to go. My name is Marion Calmer and I'm a farmer from Western Illinois. Uh, I want to say thanks to the Soybean Association for uh, inviting me to come talk to all of you this afternoon. Uh, the thing I really like about this conference versus all the other conferences that I talk at is right in the title uh, they use a pretty key word to me and this afternoon I'm going to be talking a little bit about uh, breaking my own yield barriers in soybeans but profitability and sometimes I think we overlook that. Uh, when we're doing things. But today we're going to talk a little bit about combine settings. And you know this happened this morning. The thing worked just fine. And then when I went to use it, it didn't want to work just fine. So now the cameraman's going to be mad because I'm going to move over here to the other side. Um, well anyway, we're, we're going to run through um, as quick as we can here some of my thoughts on uh, being able to uh, set the combine uh, to get maximum efficiency out of it and um, also uh, quality samples out of the grain tank. Um, but I've been farming since 1938. I also own and operate one of the largest independent ag research centers in the United States. And I've got a little research booklet. Um, if you would like to take one of those home, I've got some in the back of the room and a couple of brochures that talk a little bit about uh, what we do on combines and things. So you can help yourself and you don't necessarily have to take a lot of notes um, during the presentation. The uh, corn head business, uh, many of you maybe know that I invented the world's first 15 inch corn head in 1995. I've been growing all my corn in 15 inch rows. And then just this past year, I invented the world's first 12 inch corn head sold it to Harry Stein. Maybe you've seen, uh, we've been on the cover of a couple of magazines. Uh, just recently, Farm Industry News did a story about us. And so anyway, we're, we're pushing the edge of the envelope and producing corn in, in narrow rows. But uh, it, it gives me the opportunity um, to work with a lot of farmers um, throughout the United States. This is where my farm's at, a little town called Alpha. I'm about to, 30 minutes south of Moline, about an hour north of Peoria. I've got silty loam soils, they're dark in color, very productive. And uh, so um, as I travel, um, not only do we talk a lot about corn production, but soybeans as, as well. And I, I want to give you a few pointers here today that will help you out. Um, my background and my ancestors are heavy into the machinery business. That's uh, so my grandfather on the left and his brother would be my great uncle Barney. Um, and they were some of the first ones to take a stationary corn sheller and mount it on a solid rubber tired Model T truck. And this little water reservoir is still in our community on Route 17. And believe it or not, um, they used to go around and shell cribs. And on my mom's side and my dad's side, they both had threshing crews. And my ancestors came from Sweden and they used to build and sell self-scouring moldboard plows at about the same time Mr. John Deere did. So kind of in my blood, my uh, cousin is uh, one of the senior planter engineers for John Deere. Um, my brother is an engineer at uh, CAT. And so it all kind of runs in the, in the family. So hopefully, um, I'll give you a little background. Uh, like I said, in the mid-90s, we, we invented the world's first 15-inch corn head. We built one for the red combine, one for the green combine. But still, a lot of opportunity to talk about soybeans as well. I know before I go any further, you're all looking at this picture. <laughs> and you're saying, yeah, yeah, the red combine got more corn in it than the green combine. So you can take that for, for what it's worth. But uh, we, we, we'll, we'll try to be impartial to the color of the, of the machinery. But I wanted to put together a really good presentation for you today. So I called, and I, I've got a lot of buddies at Case and John Deere. Called them all on the phone, and, and one of the guys from CAT. And I said, man, could you help me put together this combine presentation for the Illinois Soybean Association? And they said, sure. So they all came out to my farm. And they all sat down and helped me put this presentation together. So in case you've never met them before, here are the top engineers from Deer, Case, and Caterpillar. These guys right, right here. <laughs> <laughs> How many of you are operating farm machinery that was invented by these guys? <laughs> yeah? All right, I got the right group anyway here. Combine settings. Um, a few minor little things can make a big difference. Uh, we're going to talk about bean platforms, setting the sickle, height, Draper heads. We're going to talk a little bit about threshing and separating and how does grain thresh and what causes cracks and how to make those things go away and especially green pods in the grain tank. Anybody fight those when you first start? We're seeing more and more. I'm going to tell you how to helpfully make those go away and um, get, get a better performance. 
less grain loss at the back of the machine. Last but not least, we're going to talk about spreading because we know we're going to follow with another crop. We want to do a nice job of laying down the bean straw. One of the statements I say, if you're going to push a 30-foot platform, then by God, we better be spreading 30 feet or 31 feet out the back end of the combine. So those are the three things I'm going to go through. Then we'll take a little review and hopefully I'll have enough time for a little, few questions afterwards. I'm going to talk about this a little more this afternoon, but when we talk about populations of soybeans, it's one thing to talk about yield, but the other thing is it has a huge impact on pod height. At 150,000, the, the beans are, in my opinion, crowded, going to make them grow taller, and they're also going to pod higher. Same bean, same year, same planter, planted at 75,000, and watch the bean height. Now we're down into this area, so we're only about three to four inches up. So the thinner that you plant the soybeans, the closer that they are going to pod to the ground. Ken Ferry talked a little bit about not seeing much of a yield response to high populations in beans. I'm going to echo the same thing. So when I went from 150,000 down to 75,000, podding closer to the ground, that means I've got to pay attention. I've got to do a better job of setting the combine. Here's a little bit on the data. Um, here's long term in normal years. Um, I always run four replications run the length of the field. So we're looking at 20 replications over a five year period. And on the left there, the purple bar at 50,000, 62 bushel beans. And then the blue bar at 75,000 went to 63. And then from there on out, all the way over here to 200,000, really didn't see a response to population. Now there might be some varieties out there that do respond. But these ones that I was using over that five year period. And I said we'd talk about profitability. And I think we all know that as we start to add population, got to get a return on investment. And so if I'm going to spend money to buy seed, I got to have some return. So, it, it, you know, I love everybody to death. I don't care whether it's the seed companies, the fertilizer people, the machinery people. At the end of the day, I've started to become a businessman. I want a return on investment. If I'm going to spend an extra 10 or $20 for seed, I got to have something to show for it. So my maximum profitability uh, was at 75000 and my least amount of work uh, comes over there in the purple bar at 50,000 because if you have the hired man help you load the planter in the morning and you're planting at 50,000, I mean, hell, you can plant all day and never have to stop to reload the planter. So there is some concerns there about uh, what population and how much work and how many times do you stop to reload. So um, I'm, I'm pretty fond of the 75,000 mark um, for many years. Now, as Ken mentioned this morning, and I'm going to echo this with you, um, those of us that have been tracking soybean populations over a 10, 15 year period, we're going to tell you that during a drought, we're going to see a response to population. This is the same variety that I've used in previous years. So here you can see the purple bar at 50,000 and all the way up here to 200,000 at 66. So this year we did see a response. I would also say the same thing if it's a wet year and you don't get a chance to plant until Memorial Day. I want you to plant them a little bit thicker. So in the past I've been planting them at 75,000 and this year I actually left some money on the table. I, I, didn't, I didn't have them thick enough this year. And my data would indicate that the, the gray bar there at 150,000 was the optimum plant population in the drought. I've got more plants out there in the field and I'm getting a, uh, the ability to suck up all that available moisture that was out there in the field. So anyway, just one year. Um, but um, So the question becomes next year, what, what kind of weather will we have? <laughs> and if we have a normal summer, well then I'd be better off to be at 75,000. If we have another drought, I'd be better off to be up here at that 50,000 bracket because that's about where I'm going to make my most uh, most of my money. So anyway, my maximum profitability there was at 150,000 this year. And again, still the least amount of work. Now, the other thing that I'll mention is that as you increase population, your risk of white mold goes up considerably. White mold is a population problem, not a row spacing problem. <laughs> so keep that in mind as you push it on up here in a wet year, that, that, that higher population can really hurt you from white mold. Now, at 50,000, we grow some pretty respectable yields at 50,000. 
The problem is that the stem gets huge. And if we're going to be out there with a combine cutting those big stem beans, I've actually broke some snake heads, some sickle sections. And so I had to come up with an alternative method of being able to cut those big stems off on the soybean. So this is what I used to harvest the plot with last year, right there. Was ching -ching <laughs> but <clears throat> it, it just, it's just common sense. Uh, soybeans are a legume. And the most abnormal thing we could do to a legume is to put it in a row. I, I mean, how many's got an alfalfa field at home that's in rows? You know, we've got alfalfa fields, but we don't put them in rows. Corn's the same way. Corn's a grass. Most abnormal thing we ever did to the corn plant was to put it in a row. They, they don't like competition. Um, they like to have plenty of sunlight, plenty of nutrients, plenty of water. All right, let's move on. So we're going to need to adjust the headers. Um, is this a new draper header? It actually flexes in the middle uh, to handle the contours. We want to make sure that we're cutting below the lowest pot. Some people always say, oh, I got a lot of sickle shatter. You know something? No. They got the sickle too high and they're cutting right through that bottom pot or so on the stem. So do a couple of kill stops. Get out here and, and dig underneath that uh, reel and find out, you know, have I got the sickle set too high? If in fact you do have it set too high and you want to readjust it uh, on a red machine, um, they've got a threaded bolt right in here and you can loosen up these two bolts and they're, they're slotted right here and then you can adjust that. And this is the face plate that's on the front of the feeder house. Now in my combine I've got to set the header off when I readjust this, but that's how I tip that header forward if I want to cut them a little closer to the ground. Or if I'm plugging all the time and I got a lot of residue in the field then I'll pull that header back up just a little bit as, as well. Uh, the green people now uh, have an adjustable face plate with the, the new 60 series machines. Um, and they got a jam nut right here and a turnbuckle and the same thing. You loosen up these two nuts and they're slotted and you're going to rock that face plate back and forth and um, you'd be surprised um, what a nice job you can do. Spend a little time and adjust that header on down and cut below the bottom pot. The other thing is that if we're in a no-till environment, occasionally you're going to run into some of the corn stalks from the previous season. And I grow all my corn 15 inch rows and we're starting to move to higher populations. And I, I actually end up with a residue buildup problem. And if I'm cutting beans and it's late at night and we're getting a little fog and it gets a little damp, uh, I'm going to struggle to uh, get those uh, stalks to come on across the sickle and into the header. So um, I, I'm a common sense kind of a guy. I take a tape measure here at the bottom. Got about three inches across where the brace roots are at. Now, when I was uh, coming out of college, uh, the quick cut was pretty popular, uh, white people. And it's an inch and a half sickle sections and inch and a half on the snake heads. But the problem that I had, we had two machines in the field. One of them had this sickle and the other one had a three inch sickle. And it was just the difference between night and day. And even though you think this would be better, the problem is, this is actually the corn stalk right here, and if you look at the diameter of the stalk, they normally run about three quarters to seven eighths of an inch in diameter, and they're just not going to fit into that sickle. And so then we just start bulldozing, we start pushing them down the field, and then this little corn stub right here knocks the next bean plant down, and then all of a sudden you get a ragged job out there in the field. So if, if I'm looking for a nice, clean, sweet looking field, um, I don't think I'm going to get it with the quick cut. Um, I like three inch cut uh, three inches across the snake heads and three inches between sickle sections and you can see again even with a few brace roots here we're able to get this stub and the root ball to, to, to go on into the header. We can cut it off clean, feed it on into the combine, send it on through. John Deere has a four inch cut. Um, four inches between the snake heads but two inches between the sickle sections. I'm um, kind of up in the air about the two inch sickle sections, but three inches here, I, I, I get along really well with it. Um, also sickle register, something we talk about, and that means during the stroke of the cycle back and forth on the sickle, um, we want that sickle section to stop dead center right underneath the snake head that allows the next mouthful of soybeans to come in to get cut off. And then when it cycles back over here, we want it to stop dead center under this side. That's called sickle register. I don't know that we can adjust that much anymore. In the old days on the Pittmans, we had a threaded rod. We could adjust that back and forth. But it, it, it bears checking. 
to, to make sure that you're on target here because if these don't stop, again, we could end up with a ragged cut out there in the field. Um, a little bit about the corn stalks. It's, it's becoming more of an issue, I think, to all of us if we no-till or even corn on corn or whatever, that the BT corn stalks are, are really starting to give us some obstacles to getting them to decompose in time to grow the next crop the following year. Uh, we worked pretty hard on this design, um, came up with what we call now call the BT chopper. And it's ten flutes in the circle. Uh, they're razor sharp. And we're able to cut the stalk into pieces that are about an inch long. And we're also able to shear them. And it opens up this corn stalk so that the microbes, the bacteria, earthworms are able to start breaking it down. And I'm looking to accelerate decomposition. And I'm looking to accelerate my reentry time. This is plant food, and it's also food for the earthworms. And the faster I can get it back in the soil, the better off I'll be as well. And um, on a stand here at a hand crank, um, you can see what it does, or you can stop by my booth if you want. We'll run a stock through there. You can look at it online if you want. It's a pretty cool little process, something that we worked at, and finally make, making it happen. So I think as we move into the future, BT corn stalks are going to continue to become healthier and we've got more fungicides now than we ever have. And that, that baby is just almost like a miniature hedge tree as far as trying to get it to decompose. So if you're in a no-till system um, and you're, you're in a um, corn soybean rotation, being able to get the stalks down on the ground, feed the earthworms, get the microbes, bacteria, this stuff will melt down pretty fast, turn it back into the, into the soil. <clears throat> So if it's late at night and or during one of those days when it's kind of foggy, you know, and it doesn't have a whole lot of sunlight, we always have a little trouble in no-till being able to get the cornstalk residue across the sickle and into the cross auger. And so take some time, get out there, look at your cutter height. And what I would have trouble with if there was a uh, even like a 30-inch corn row uh, and the stalks and the stubble are in this area, they just simply will come across the sickle and stop. And so late at night, I'd have to quit cutting beans because I just couldn't get those corn stalks to feed into the header. Uh, John Deere's done a nice job. They, they, I apologize here in the back, but this is a, a full-fingered cross auger. And so they have retractable fingers uh, across the entire length of the auger. Reach out there, grab the material, pull it on in. I think it's a good idea. They had it in South America for, for, for quite a while. And they brought it here to the US. Uh, John Deere also runs a stainless steel tray. And I really like that as, as well. We're, we're interested in trying to get that material from the sickle to the auger as quickly and as smoothly as possible. Uh, in adjusting the cross auger, if you've still got a conventional head, we need to talk about the clearance between the auger and the tray. On a corn head, we, we like to run about an inch and three quarters of clearance because we don't want to crack the kernels. If you're cracking grain in your combine when you're picking corn, go, go and look at that cross auger because it'll actually slice through the husk and through the kernels and into the cob and it'll crack grain. In soybeans, a different story. I want to run this auger as close as I can to the tray because I'm going to close this distance in right here and I'm going to be able to suck that material underneath a lot quicker. The tighter it is, the more suction that I have to pull that material away from the sickle. Draper heads. Anybody in here running a draper head at home? Oh, quite a few guys. How are you getting along with them? I, I, yeah, I've yet to find a person. And if I was to try to get you to go back to conventional head, would you do it? No. And we had, we had a fellow in the earlier session here. So as you go through time and you get ready to go to the next machine or you trade your platform, I'd really strongly consider uh, going to the draper head. Yes, sir? Up there in the middle where that turnbuckle thing is. Yeah. They have a, a uh, now they have a uh, hydraulic cylinder there which will pitch your head forward or back. You can adjust right on the go. Yep, and that's, that's really sweet. So what he's talking about is this hydraulic cylinder right here. We can adjust the pitch. So at night, if the sickle starts to plug, we can rock her back just a little bit. The guy earlier this morning said he plays with that quite a bit during, during the day. So I, I think it's a great step in the right direction here as we move into the future. A lot less trouble with bunching in this area. Um, a lot less header loss. It's just a, just a whole chain of events of, of good things. This happens to be the McDonough head um, out there. But uh, what, what do they run uh, dollar-wise versus a, a convention? Double. Huh? To, double? For the same footage, um, just about double the price of a standard. 
Oh dear. I'd, I'd heard that they were a little more... Well, yeah. <laughs> Um, but do you think that it's worth it to, to go to the, even though you spend more money? Look at it as a one-time investment. Right. So when you go to trade, the value will be there. Will be there. Yeah. And you guys run a McDon heads? Well, it's, a, it's a case made by McDon. Okay. All right. Anybody else running any other Draper? Yes, sir? I think you're, uh, you'll cut down on your fuel costs, and it's so easy on your machine. Yep. I, I think there's other... Uh, There's a whole lot of. Yeah. So what, what you're saying is, even though you spend a little more money, the return on investment profitability is there. You're going to have less header loss. So. Yeah. Yeah. Just, uh, life's simple. Yeah. Going to last a little. Bunching up. Well, and uh, just the fact that you can tip that head on the go. Right. Is is worth quite a bit. How about trouble free? Are they trouble free? Yeah. Uh, ours is just one year, year, but no trouble. trouble. So. <laughs> now, how anybody ever used a Draper head in rocks? Any different than a conventional platform in rocks? We've had that question a couple of times. You know you I wouldn't think it'd be any different, better or worse. Knife up. Yeah, he makes a good point. If you are in rocks, you can actually tip it on back just a little bit and stay up. Now, and, and, and it would be another point, if, if you've got many rocks in the field, you might want to plant your beans thicker just to get them pods up off the ground so that you're not down in with the, the rocks out there. So anyway. I would just confirm what these gentlemen are saying. I, the, the, you know, I give this presentation for the last 10 years at the National No-Till Conference, and uh, I, I've yet to run into anybody that didn't like a Draper head when they got into that category. Um, adjusting the feeder chain. Um, this is the slot here. The header is actually out here to our left, and this is the adjusting bolt. Now, my case dealer would tell me that, Marion, you need to put in a new feeder chain because yours is about wore out because you're about out of adjustment. Contrary to that, I would say, you know what, I think it's adjusted just exactly right, and here's why. There, there, during the handoff from the header to the feeder chain, there is a dead air space between the auger and the feeder chain, whether you're picking corn or whether you're cutting beans, and there is no upside. <laughs> to having a bigger dead air space than, than what's necessary. So I add splice links, half links to my feeder chain. I think I put in six rollers on my feeder chain to finally get that sucker down here. And it's just amazing how much better it works both in corn and, and in beans. So I like to be about one or two screws back from being fully extended. And then the next year I'll maybe pull out a half link or something and get myself a little more adjusted. So uh, a little something on adjusting feeder houses. But at the end of the day, this is what I want to see from the cab. I don't want to see any bunching out here, and I want to see that material being sucked off of the sickle as quick as possible, and adjusting the reel at the right speed, and all of those. So there's a lot of neat little things on the header that make all the difference in the world as far as getting a good job out there in the field. Now, I'm a struggling Bears fan, I'll admit that for sure. And I like auto steer, but I like to watch my Bears football on Sunday afternoons or on a Monday night if we happen to be cutting beans. I don't know if you guys do this or not, but I, when I went to auto steer, I put a TV in the cab with me and so I can watch Bears football on Sunday afternoon while I'm cutting beans. And, uh, well, you know, I don't know about you guys, I like to have an occasional beer when I'm watching the Bears play football. And if they're having a bad game, it takes more than one beer to get through the end of the game. But anyway, it happened to be a Sunday where uh, they went into overtime. So I drank more than a six pack while I watched the game and we ended up losing the game. And so anyway, it got to be dark and I'd finished my six or eight beers that I'd had during the day. And sure enough, during, during the evening hours, my auto steer quit working. And I'm like, ah, oh, not a problem. I'll just go back to running it manual. I'd had six or eight beers. I went back to running it manual. Finally, it got tough enough. I decided to quit for the evening and went home. So anyway, when I came back the next morning after having those beers and running it on manual, this is what the field looked like when I came back the next day, you know, out there. So I'm not sure that that's something I'm going to advise people to do is to drink beer and watch football. How, how much different is that than normal? Oh, how much different is that than normal? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. Uh, there, there's been days where it looks like that, even if I try not to. Um, but auto steer, I think, you know, both in planting and in combining, you know, I, I, the fatigue for operators, uh, it's, it's a great addition. So, um, combine and green beans, um, we've all done it. You can tell in this photograph we're into some pretty green beans. Um, the biggest problem that I see with combine and green beans is pods in the, in the grain tank. And we're all doing it, and I think as the time goes by in the future, um, 
we're going to see more and more green stem beans at, at harvest time. And we like to cut them early and get them on time. Now, so here's the question. Pods in the green tank. And, and we've all done it, myself included. I've always gone down and closed the bottom sieve. First thing you do, close the bottom sieve. Pods in the green tank, is that a separating problem? Or is that a threshing problem? It's a threshing problem. And so then that train of thought kicks in now and say, all right, to solve this problem, I've got to go back and see what's wrong with my threshing system. And so we did a kill stop and uh, grabbed a handful of what was below me. And sure enough, there's quite a few pods, green pods, down in there. And I'm just like, well, they were supposed to have been threshed at the concave area. And so what happens when the pod falls through the concave, it gets into the auger bed, it goes back here to the sieve, and it drops through, and then the return kicks it back out, and it comes back up around, and it drops the pot in up there, and then what happens? It falls through, it goes on the auger bed, and it goes, so I don't, you know, I'd like to put a little sensor on these green pods and see just how many revolutions does it make? <laughs> and inevitably, I think it's going to either end up on the ground or in the green tank. It's going to go one place or the other. So I think we need to deal with it. But here's the common sense part of it, and, you know, I tell everybody it's a sad day in America when common sense isn't so common anymore. And so that's one of the things I try to teach my employees and my daughter and, and the people that I visit with. But right here, just grab the pod, walk up to the concave, and what's it do? It falls through. Is it going to get threshed? No. And so we try to have concaves that work both for corn and beans. And it's not just specific to the red people. I mean, the green people are the same way. They've got a round bar concave, and the pods are going to drop through there as well. So if I can't get it to thresh, I got to increase my threshing power, not necessarily the speed, not necessarily the concave clearance, I need to increase my threshing power. So how does grain thresh? Is it the metal that hits the pod? Or is it the pods rubbing against pods? And there we are, the gentleman's nodding up here in front. The best way to thresh grain is to rub grain against grain. You'll always have a higher quality sample out there. So in order to get beans to thresh, we need to make them rub against themselves to get them out of the green pods. Now, how do we crack grain? That's when the metal hits the grain. And speed is the number one contributing factor to cracks in both corn and soybeans. And so I like to speed the rotor up until I see a few cracks and then I back off. Now if you're cutting seed beans, um, the first day back after a rain, there's a, like a positive pressure on the inside of the bean and, and they'll just split like a son of a gun that first day back. So if you're cutting seed beans, I'd, I'd suggest the first day back after a rain is to go cut some conventional beans. Then the next day, uh, they'll, they'll uh, those, those pressures will neutralize and you can cut your seed beans on the second or the third day after a dry down. So, how are we going to get those beans to rub against themselves or those pods? And, and you know, and I talked about this with Dad, and he goes, oh, that's nothing new. He said all of our older combines used to have filler plates in them, uh, wheat, soybeans. And it's just nowadays that we're all in such a hurry to go from corn and beans that we don't talk about this much. But it's, a very, in my opinion, a very real part of cutting green beans. I use two filler plates on the first concave, and I leave the rest of them open. And that way I'm going to hold those pods in the chamber a little bit longer and I'm going to make the pods rub against each other. The green people have the same thing. You can actually look in the owner's manual and this is a concave insert. It snaps in there. I think the deer people actually did a little better than the case people. Um, you got a part number and, and it, it clicks in there and snaps in and it, it just takes a, a few moments to put it in there. But boy, if you're running a green combine and you've got pods in a green tank, just snap that baby in there, make them rub against their cells and, the, and they'll come out of the pod. And then, as we start to think this on through, so what happens in the rest of the machine now? Now that I've got more threshed pods, do I have to have the bottom sieve so tight? Open the bottom sieve up. What's that allow the air to do? Come on up through the machine. Fan's not working as hard. I'm blowing the holes out the back. It's just a whole chain of events takes place. And I, I really encourage you to give this some thought, give it a try, and, and do a better job of rubbing the pods out when they initially come into the combine on that first pass, and, and you'll be a lot happier. Um, I'm running a lot less return when I look at my tailings monitor now. I've got a lot less grain loss than what I had in the past. It's kind of a bugger when you're switching from corn and beans to put these in, but I think the uh, return on investment, the time, is, is very valuable. 
Um, so I like to do kill stops quite a bit, uh, do, a, do a lot of them in corn, I do a few of them in beans. And I can guarantee you, um, if you're pushing a 30 foot uh, platform and they're green stem beans and you're, you're, you're humping it on down the field about four mile an hour and, and, and with the red combine we just reach over and yank the throttle back. And it's pretty easy to get her to come to stop. Uh, when, when you're cutting green beans. The problem <laughs> is getting it to restart. <laughs> and, um, it, and I've had several times where I've had to open the concave up to get it to restart after a kill stop. Corn, you can hit the switch, she'll come right back to life. But boy, it, with, with a load of green stems in there, it's, it's pretty tough. But anyway, this is, I always say the health of my machine is right here. And I'm going to put my little hat underneath there, I'm going to pop the tray, and then I'm going to examine uh, the material that's in that return. And yeah, there's, there's a couple of pods in there, but I've, you know, in this particular kill stop, I've got a lot of holes. And they really shouldn't be in the return, they should have blown out. So I've, I've learned something, I need to do a little more work on setting my combine here in the future. Um, I'd like to just see pods only in that return tailings. But I, I, I mean, unless you do a kill stop and you drop the trap, I don't think you're going to know what's coming back uh, around through the machine. So in corn, we had this, and I'll, I'll address this right now. When I'm combining corn and I'm setting the sieves, I'm going to disagree with John Deere, Case, and Cat. I think they're wrong. They, they want you to close the bottom sieve to take the cobs out of the grain tank. <laughs> My statement is, which part of the corn kernel are they trying to rethresh? And you, th you think about it, and I know we've all done it, and you think about it, and there's just no sense of closing the bottom sieve when you're shelling corn. And so I run with the bottom sieve wide open, allows the air to come on up to the top sieve, and I clean the grain tank with the top sieve. And it does a beautiful job, and there's a few people doing it. How many of you adjust your combines like that? You guys do? Okay. And, and, and so here's a quick example for you, and then I'll move on to some more things. We were, we were picking at the Farm Progress Show. We run one of the combines with our heads. And the little John Deere guy come running around up there. We had a John Deere combine. He said, well, he said, we're helping everybody set their machines. And I said, really? I don't think he knew who I was. <laughs> and so anyway, he come up and, and he said, this is the settings. And, and I said, that means you got your bottom sieve tighter than the top sieve. And he says, oh, yeah. He said, that's the way you set the machine. And I said, really? I said, which part of the corn kernel are you trying to rethresh? <laughs> he was speechless. <laughs> so he crawled down off of the machine and I said, you're going to have trouble. Well, you're okay in dry corn. I said, you're going to have trouble in wet corn and you're going to slug the return elevator. No, nah, no, nah, we're fine. We got big combine. They were running a 16 row 30 inch corn head. So sure enough, the second day we were shelling 30% moisture corn. And my buddy and I were sitting in there, we watched them go down the field. And by God, they got halfway down the field and they plugged the return leg with wet corn. And they were right there, the rope line, there was 2,000 people right there and they stopped, opened the trap, put about five bushel of wet corn on the ground, closed the trap, went on down the field. There, there is no upside to rethreshing corn. Pull the bottom sieve wide open, take it out, let the fan and the air do what they want to do and just open and close the top sieve. All right, let's move on. A well-balanced combine will have the same amount of loss over the sieves as it does over the rotor. So anyway, what I like to do is adjust the veins and try to regulate that machine and I'm clicking back and forth when I'm going from corn to beans. I can adjust the sieves or the uh, <coughs> transport veins um, that allows me to go from corn or beans. If I'm in corn, I retard the veins because I want to run one more revolution. When I'm in soybeans, I don't have any reason to keep the straw in the machine. So I rotate those veins, kick the straw right on out of the machine. Green combine doesn't allow us to adjust the veins. Um, they're welded in position. But anyway, spend a little time while you're going down through the field and you're on auto steer, click back and forth, and then turn the meter, meter sensitivity all the way up and you'll be able to tell. The STS, of course, is supposed to stand for single tying separator. It also stands for stolen technology systems as, as well. So, <laughs> All right, these are the owner's manual. They're wrapped up in plastic. If you get a chance, you might take the plastic off and read through them once in a while. Uh, let's take a quick shot on a kill stop here. Um, straw chopper on a red machine is on the inside. We set the <laughs> concave in here. Keep the blades good and sharp. Also, you can tell where the wind is at on the sieve. I apologize again for you in the back. Over here, 
Um, we don't have much wind at all and this chamber's full of mog. This, this chamber is really clean and then it just keeps getting a little thicker is why I move over to this side. Um, these are the hillside attachments. It's a, a, a plate that bolts onto the chaffer. Keeps that material from sliding. If you've ever shelled corn on a hillside, you come back about a month later and you see a green stripe that goes around the side of the hill. Um, these will help, but again, um, open that bottom sieve, let the wind come to the top sieve. Spreading, last but not least here. When I pull into the soybean field, <coughs> my question to you is, where are you going to start? Sound like an odd question. I was out in Nebraska. The responses I got in Nebraska, when I pull into the field, where do I start? Well, next to the truck. <laughs> or the other guy said, at the gate hole, you know, and I'm like, that's okay. But after we cut the endros, do we really care do you, you, which side of the field you start on? There you go. I, I'd agree with that 100%. It's, it's something that hopefully your dad maybe taught you or something you've thought of yourself. But this is what I like to see as a crosswind. I'm, I'm cutting beans north and south. The, the prevailing winds normally come out of the west, so I'm normally going to start on the east side of the field. I want to be on the downwind side of the field. And you can see the dust blowing across here. And I'm cutting 30 feet. I want to spread 31 feet. So I got a little bit of overlap. I don't want to see any tram lines out there in the field when you get done cutting beans. My suggestion is start on the downwind side of the field. Work your way into the wind when you cut beans. If, in fact, you have a fire, you're going to be glad that you started on the downwind side of the field. So my last statement here, and I'll open it up for questions, is about fire. And we, we all love our combines. And I carry a fire extinguisher, uh, a heavy leather coat, and a flashlight with me just in case of, of fire. And I keep them right there in the cab so that I can see them at all times. If it's at the beginning of the season, combine's working pretty good. It's a relatively new machine. Uh, got low hours on it. I smell smoke while well, I'm going to bail out of the cab. Take the fire extinguisher with me, flashlight. I'm going to find the smoke. And I'm going to put the fire out. Now, if it happens to be at the end of the season, and the combine's got a lot of hours on it. <laughs> oh, you guys are way ahead of me, aren't you? <laughs> and it's been breaking down quite a bit, and I'm about due for a new machine, and I smell smoke. When I bail out of the cab, I take the heavy leather coat with me, and then I fan that baby <laughs> to see if I can get it to go. And if I'm really lucky, uh, you can get her to burn, by God. So, um, anyway. Uh, that's kind of my thoughts on setting combines and um, like I said, you, you got to be careful. Carry a little three gallon sprayer with you um, with water, uh, five gallon bucket of water, a couple of fire extinguishers and you'd be surprised you can save from having a total disaster of burning not only your crop but the neighbor's crop and those kind of things. And we had an incident in our part of the country about 15 years ago, the neighbor caught his cornfield on fire. And we're right along Interstate 74, and of course the fire was on the west side of the interstate. And uh, there was one person that panicked and they hit the brakes and it was a 28 car pileup, killed two people. And it was as if you had stacked those cars on top of each other, worst thing I'd ever saw. And I saw it from the field and I went and got the disc and uh, started disking and we finally got it under control. But it was, it's ugly. So just a little bit of that preventive maintenance. All right, do I have a couple minutes for questions, or do you think I need to turn them loose here? You have five minutes, though. Oh, I still have five minutes? Yeah. That's what you said five minutes ago. Ten minutes. It's a strategy. It's a strategy that you use. Okay, so we talked a little bit about bean platforms. I think we're all going to be in agreement. When you get a chance, you're going to trade heads. I, I'd go for the draper head. Um, but remember, pod height is just that sickle. Threshing and separating, the main thing, take-home message right there is, Read your owner's manual. Put in some filler plates. Do something. But when I'm cutting green stem beans and I got pods in there, I, I've got to have some help to rub those pods together, get the beans out of there. And it just makes life a lot more fun when I'm cutting beans. And the spreading thing, I know I'm going to follow um, a year later with corn or something. And not only do I want to spread the straw, but I also want to spread the chaff. 30 feet as well. Now I run, even though my combine is supposed to spread chaff um, on the two spinners, it doesn't. And so I've got a chaff spreader underneath and I've opened it up and I let the chaff come right off the sieve onto the chaff spreader and then I use the top spinners to spread the straw. Any questions? Comments? Don't know that I could have done that good of a job. Yes sir? 
retard the veins to, in beans and slow them down? Will that keep the crop in the, <coughs> the rotor enough to do that without doing the filling? I, I don't think so. The, the pods, in my opinion, are going to be off the stem before the first revolution in the cage. And therefore, they're going to start dropping and, and they're going to end up on the auger bed. The other downside to leaving the veins in the retarded position with a red combine is that I'm going to grind up those green stems and I'm going to get some more green silage down on the top sieve and it, it'll complicate things. Plus, I'm going to bleed a fair amount of horsepower. Um, advancing the veins um, in the red combine and green beans is like adding another 50 horsepower. It is amazing. I know it's a pain to crawl up into that cage. Um, I use an air ratchet with a deep well socket. And you can reach up in there and pull the trigger and zip them loose and spin them back. And I know you're in a hurry to go from corn to beans, but uh, you get up in there and blow all the garbage out of the cage. And I, it's really not too bad a job. I think it takes the hired man like 10 minutes to do it. <laughs> retarding the flow for corn yep. and advancing the flow for beans. It would be my opinion. Yep. splitting the differences. And yeah, it, it would be my opinion that in corn, I, I, I want to retard the flow. The, the, the cob and, and is, is exiting the rotor just a little too quickly and I've got maybe one or two kernels that are still on the cob. So once I retard the veins, my, my rotor loss, I used to have meter sensitivity around six or seven when I had them in the middle position and as soon as I retarded the veins when I was picking corn I was able to crank the meter sensitivity up to 10. It, it, was, it was pretty significant and my separator loss was just virtually nothing. And we've always just run ours in the middle. And I think we all do. Now the case people are working on making that adjustment from the cab but there's a tremendous amount of power on those transport veins when you're cutting green beans and it's difficult unless you've got them torqued down it's really difficult to get them to hold and, and what happens is the linkage starts to bleed oil or something and then they they, they don't do what you want them to do so um, it's, it's um, an interesting aspect but if I'm looking for maximum performance I'm going to retard them in corn I'm going to advance them in soybeans. Yes, sir. When you talk filler plates, we've got a newer red machine, and they made the feeder house wider. Okay. So the space between the tire and the frame on the right side is almost zero. So to There's work to get in, the oh, concrete, oh, 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 oh. you almost you have, have to, to remove the main off. drive tires. You know, I have trouble with my 2388 to get in there the way it is right now. It's half that size. Oh Lord. Yeah. And it's sad. It's, it's, it's a huge, you know, what I tried to go through here was some of the huge adjustments that, that have a really good return on the time that you would spend to do those things. Well, this would be a huge amount of time well, now to get the tire off. Or just to well, make a repair of something. You can do it stuff. without taking the tire off. But, but it's no fun. It's not fun. Any other questions out here? Yes, sir. How about your the knife rolls you were talking about for corn to chop the VT corn? Um, what about the down corn? We have a, a, what's called a revolving window, entry window, and if you read through the brochure you'll see a little about it. We have different length flutes on that stock roll, and so um, when the short flutes come together it creates a little feeding chamber, allows the stock to come in there. Um, the other thing that we noticed in down corn was when we went to 10 flutes in the circle, if I can get a hold of that stock with the 10 flutes I'll just be able to continue to reel it on in. When we were testing with deer and case with four or six flutes, if you sharpen them, you could actually just cut them off and they'd right. fall over. Right. But boy, with that 10 flutes, it just really helped a bunch. And we've been real tickled with it in, in down corn. I got one more question right here and then I'll let them all go. Um, one thing we struggle with in the seed industry is, uh, is dirty seed, where the dirt will adhere to the seed coat. Yeah. As you harvest. Right. In, in your opinion, where's, where's the biggest place that that's coming from? Well, if, if there's any tillage in the system and you bring up some of the root balls and then they lay there, or even with a no-till planter, you kick up any root balls to get any soil in them, um, they're, they're going to end up going through the machine. So that's the first thing I would look for is to try to get that nice mat um, down underneath. Um, the second thing is, is going to be to tip that sickle back and, and keep it above. Now, if, this, if the headers start to plug, the uh, first thing that's going to happen is you're, you're going to have some of that moist soil that's going to come into the header. 
So I would, number one, I would check their management skill or the management system prior to, to, to planting the beans. And then number two, I would look at readjusting the, the header height. Anybody else have any other comments or thoughts on dirt in the, so, excuse me, soil in the green tank? So. Alrighty, you've been a great group. I look forward to talking to you this afternoon, um, something about uh, breaking through my own yield barrier. So I look forward to visiting with the rest of you. You've been a wonderful group. Again, thanks to the Soybean Association for having me. Been a great group. Thank you very much.